Our speaker today is something that a lot of you probably know. Um, it's an awesome guy and someone that I have a ton of respect for. Um, a few things just to note about our speaker is that he's been a football coach for over 45 years at both the high school and the college level. And he knows pretty much every single football coach across the entire state and the network that he's built and the connections he's made through top football coaching is impressive. He's been married to his wife for 48 years, he's the father of two, grandfather of three. Really cool fact, or just in, uh, thing about our speaker is that he has had cancer twice and he's beat it twice. And he's currently serving the Lord by being on staff with SCA here in Northwestern Wisconsin. So I'm really excited and I'm thankful to be able to introduce you to my friend, Bob Lichty. Got it? How many were at the uh, church dart ball banquet the other night? Okay, it's kind of the same speech, but you're going to have pictures now. All right? I'll never forget when I first got into coaching, uh, Coach Walker said, you know, whenever you speak, if you can't be dazzling with your BS, be dazzling with your overheads. And, uh, we'd, and for you young guys, you don't know what our overheads are anyway. So, uh, yeah, just to think... Uh, Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, the other night speaking, uh, that dartball thing is like one of the best kept secrets there is. <laughs> I was truly amazed at that and the hospitality. I, I have a question though. You know, like you got two teams, so if you clear the bench, it says if there's a bench clearing brawl, you have to leave the darts on the side. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my name is Bob Lichty. I serve on FCA. Um, I, sometimes I don't know how to put it together because you got all, you're trying to hear mingle. So first I'm going to tell you what I'm doing now, and then I'm going to tell you how I got here. Okay, so I'm on staff with FCA. I do coaches ministry. Uh, who we are, we're a community working to see the world transformed by Jesus Christ through the influence of coaches and athletes. Because we all know we're, <laughs> what a stage sports has right now. We all know what stage that is. And it's not always the best stage. Okay, why we do it? We desire to see every coach and athlete enter into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, through sports, because that's where they're at. And that's what, you know, that's what Christ did. He went to where they were at, and so we go to where coaches and athletes are. What do we do? We seek to make disciples through our strategy of engaging, equipping, and empowering coaches and athletes to grow, know and grow in Christ and lead others to do the same. And that's you know, what we want to do. We just want to lead people there so they can do the same thing. I work with coaches so they can work with their athletes. We work with athletes so they can work with other athletes. We work with athletes so when they graduate, they can go out and do that. We are disciple makers. And how do we do it? Through huddles, which are small groups, both coaches and players. Uh, <clears throat> I had the opportunity, I've only been on staff for uh, like five years, but I, I was with FCA for over 30 years in both Bruce, Menominee and then at various colleges uh, uh, running student huddles and then coaches huddles. Uh, we have camps uh, and, and events. Uh, here's our staff. Uh, this is uh, Tim Gunnerson is our uh, area director. Uh, he's not here today so he has deniable cul culpability in case I screw up. He'll say I wasn't there. Uh, Andrew Draper sitting back there. Andrew's been around for long, longer. And then Johnny is the newest member of our staff. Okay, so that's our local staff. We have a couple camps coming up. Uh, junior sports camp is, is down Fall Creek coming up in June. And then we have our big camp, which is our sports camp, the end of uh, June up at Bethel College, uh, which we have over 500 athletes. And uh, <clears throat> in a multiple sports and we've got some cards up here if, if uh, you'd like to take one. You know he talked about being husbands and this. How many grandfathers do we have in here? How many great grandmas? Okay. You are one of the biggest influences in your grandkids life. Okay. You are probably the, <laughs> the biggest influence as far as their faith. Because somehow it's getting skipped over. And if you're not answering that call then you're, then you're not answering Christ. 
You have to step up with your grandkids. Sometimes you have to step up in a place and invite them places that they're maybe not being invited to. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later with my own grandkids. All right. So, uh, through events, huddles, uh, this was down at the uh, National uh, American Football Coach Association. We have a breakfast there. Last week we were down in uh, Madison for the state football. We had a breakfast there. Uh, Jared Abadera spoke, and it's a, it's a way of engaging coaches. Okay, here's a free meal, show up. And uh, there's our huddles, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's our football huddle at Stout that I work with. Uh, we get about 30 guys. Uh, the new, Rob Erickson, who's the new coach here, when he got the job here, he came to South Dakota, where John Stiglmeyer is, and he made a call. Hey, I hear what you're doing in Stout, we'd like to do it here at Eau Claire. And I said, well, I don't think Clay would be real happy if I came over and started your huddle, but I'll put Johnny on it. <laughs> so Claire now has a huddle, and Rob is doing that. So those are the things that are going on with, with our huddles, and, uh, plus all the huddles that we have out in the schools. And that's where uh, uh, Johnny and, and Andrew do a great job of working with the people within those schools to keep the huddles going. All right. Life rope. Every year, Keith would come to me, and he'd go, uh, we need some speakers. All right, who, who can you get? All right, well, this life rope, it talks about average age, age of men now is like 76, the average, and most of you have beat the average here. Anyway, <laughs> I'll be 76 in September. So Keith came up to me this year and he goes, hey, I need a speaker this year, and I'm going, well, I'll see you. No, no, I want you. See, Keith knew this. This is one of my last chances. <laughs> You know, next year, it's a 50-50 it's goal. So that's why he had me here this year, and I'm really glad that he did. But, you know, that's our life rope. We, we start here, there's a beginning and the end. But this is really what our rope looks like. <laughs> All right? I don't know, but mine does. My rope is like that. It twists, it turns, it's, and I'm going to talk about that today, and there's knots in it, okay? But that's what life is about. It's not that straight 76 years. And that's what got me here. It's those twists and turns and everything else. You know, as I look around the room, I see people, I'll talk about Mike Ridland helped me get through grad school at Stout in 1975 with Evelyn Rimel, because she would never let me graduate. But he and Jerry Davis got me through, okay? So, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. And sometimes God does good things in our life to get us going. Sometimes he gets us a job so we can get the next job. Sometimes he just blesses us. But then sometimes, this isn't biblical, but I believe it. Thank God for the broken road that led me back to you. And that's probably been more of my life. Because I'm kind of a reluctant learner. You know, God had to do a lot of work with me. You know, a lot of times he blessed me and I just didn't take advantage of it. So he had to do things like this. So, this is my mom and dad. Uh, this is at their 50th uh, wedding anniversary. I, I'm going to jump ahead. I'm the oldest of nine. So yes, I am Catholic. And for the evangelicals, we are Christians. <laughs> uh, but at their anniversary, I, when I spoke up to speak, I looked around. We've never had a divorce in nine. And I attribute that, and I don't know why other than that, what they modeled, being together that long. Now, they died shortly after, but they just did that. You know, and it wasn't easy. My mom is Irish Catholic, all right? She, uh, she's fiery. My dad was a member of the uh, Brethren Church. He converted, because my mom is Irish Catholic, which and also explains why my grandma Lichty rarely spoke to my mom the rest of her life, but that's what she did. And that's the way I was raised. So yes, I'm the oldest of nine, Catholic. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, here in the front row, this is my son. This picture was, he's 43 right now, okay. <laughs> that's what it was like back then, I don't even know. I don't know the names. But my parents did a great job. That was taken uh, about a year ago with all my siblings and there's, uh, we've lost two brother-in-laws, one about a month ago, but never divorced. And I attribute that to my parents and God. They were great models. Okay, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. And I, I try and press kids I work with today. 
Because everybody, media, they're not, there's something wrong with you. No. God made you. You're made in the image of God. Not like God. God said, here's what I want you to be. And he made you that way. And so don't let anybody else tell you that. Okay? So that's how he made me. <laughs> that's probably the cutest picture I ever had. Uh, and I think they did Photoshop it. Uh, I've always liked football. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, I, so when I was like five years old, I went to public school down the street, and uh, my uncle was my hero. He'd been in World War II, he came back, played football in college. You know, was, uh, he played for a semi-pro team in, in Iowa, but he would go back, he'd live in uh, Florida. He was like a glorified lifeguard. And then he'd come back and play football. So when I was like five years old in kindergarten, one night, you know how uncles, you know, tell you great stories. Why don't you come back to Florida with me? I'll teach you how to really play football. I'm five years old, I am all in. Next day I go to kindergarten, it's half day. The end of the kindergarten, the end of the day, I roll up my, my blanket that we slept on back in those days. The teacher go, where are you going? Well, I'm moving to Florida. I'm going with my uncle. So I walk out the door, it's like three blocks home back when kids would actually walk to school, and uh, walk in the door, and the teacher called my mom, and she goes, we're so sorry to see that Bob's leaving. And my mom goes, what? Yeah, he said he's leaving. Well, I walked in the door, my mom was not real happy, and when my uncle showed up, it was a fireworks. <laughs> yeah, he didn't come back for a while. And then the next day, I had to take my back blanket, or my rug, and I had to go walking back to school because I wasn't moving to Florida. All right. But my parents did sacrifice a lot. That's a, I went to St. Mary's grade school. It, uh, we had a, uh, for eight years. Um, and I, I got to tell you, I... I, went, I was in Catholic schools for 12 years, and I had a great teachers. I had great priests, nun, lay people to taught me. Okay, they did a lot of great, they were really good people. The problem was, the things they weren't, they were teaching me weren't as much fun as the things that I wanted to do. So when I, when I strayed, it wasn't on them. They were trying to do the best they could. It was on me. But I went there, and in sixth grade was the first chance we had to play football. And as a sixth grader, you're on sixth, seventh, eighth grade, Essentially, we were like two blocks from the field, so our job was to haul out those old canvas dummies of sixth graders and carry them for two blocks, then get knocked down with them for two hours and then carry them back. But I had, our coach said, was a guy named Larry Dolan, he was a college kid, and he just made me feel that I was something, a part of something bigger than who I was. As a sixth grader, with all his eighth grader, he just made me feel important. And it was at that point, you know, I love football, I knew I wanted to coach because I wanted to do that for other kids. I wanted other kids to feel what I felt. You know, it's not about winning games that, but feel that you were a part of something. Feel that you belonged. So from there I went to Columbus High School uh, four years uh, <clears throat> and I ran into another coach. Uh, it was like my, uh, in my sophomore year, we got a new coach in. Uh, he was a, he played at the University of Iowa, high power. And so I spent the summer, <laughs> I lived clear the other side of town, like six miles, and so it was a haul, a haul for me to get over. My mom, we had nine kids. She wasn't gonna be calling, my dad was on the road. At the end of the summer, as we're getting ready for fall ball, he calls me in. And he just says, you know, I don't think it's gonna work for you. I think you should try something else, because you're never gonna play for me here. And uh, I was pretty devastated, you know, because this, this is what I loved to do. This is where I felt like I was more. And this guy had just taken away. So I go walking out, and of course everybody else is getting ready for the season, and I just kind of sneak out the back door. Well, I'm six miles from home, and I start walking. It's July in Iowa. And it's hot, and it's dusty, and I'm kind of an emotional guy. I'm kind of a few tears. And all of a sudden, you ever been walking down the street, and you feel somebody driving up behind you? Okay, you, you know there's a car there, but you're not going to look. That was me. And finally pulled over. It was one of my coaches. And uh, he says, how are you doing? And he says, I'm fighting back the tears. You know, you're kind of stuttering. And he says, uh, yeah, I just left uh, up there. I understand the coach talked with you. And I'm muttering. And he says, yeah. He says, you got a choice to make. And he says, well, no, I don't. He already told me. He says, no, you have a choice to make. Today you have a choice. You can let others determine your decisions or you can determine your own decisions. That's your choice. What he essentially was telling me is that the coach could say, I'm never gonna play you, but that doesn't mean you can't be on the team. And so I went back and 
I stayed there two years and the coach stuck to his word too. Never started for him. So anyway, also at the end of there, there's a guy named, that was Larry Bach, he was, he was our uh, uh, line coach. Are there any North Dakota State fans here? North Dakota State? There you go. A guy second from the right there, his name is Bob Kleiman. His son used to be the coach at North Dakota State. <laughs> anyway, Larry was our wrestling coach, and he heard, that I, I went into the coach at the end, our coach at the end of the season, I like to go play college ball, which he, he laughed at me. You can't play for me. Why do you want to play college ball? Well, I had grown a little bit, and I was a little bit better, but I had a dream. So Larry called the coach at uh, Northern Iowa, and at that time, you, you had freshman teams. So <laughs> it was like uh, that, that movie Marshall, we'll take anybody to fill the ranks. And so uh, I went there, and the, uh, Dennis Remmer let me get on the team. Well, as luck would have it, you know, I'd gotten bigger, I'd gotten stronger. And the guy in the back row, on the, our second last row on the far right, was this scholarship kid. He gets hurt. Well, they got nobody else, they got to play me. And so I had the opportunity to play, and I, I was really pumped up after that. And, um, you know, went, went through the season, I got a chance to play. I was really excited. Went into the spring. Okay, and, and I was really excited about it, but also uh, getting back to my parents, both my parents were in the Navy in World War II. You know, for those are, generations have changed. Like my aunts and uncles, 80% of them were in the service. My generation was less. The next one is even less, which is a problem we have when people don't know how to serve. But my parents were in, and so the time came that summer, and um, actually, uh, it was uh, like summer 1970. Uh, each of us should use whatever gift he has received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. And I just felt that it was time to go in service. And so I did. All right, now if you believe that, you'll believe anything. What happened was when they at the spring ball, the coach says, uh, scholarship kids back. You can come try out in the fall. All right. The other thing is, I was an offensive lineman, and we sometimes make up things in our mind, especially our relationship with women, like they're better than we are. So at the uh, probably at the end of my freshman year, the girl that I thought I was dating, and that through high school, and that called me and said she was joining the convent. So the, between those two things, I thought the only thing I can join the army. <laughs> so that's what I did. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for you to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Thank God for the broken road that led me back to you. So, because the coach wasn't, I had, the scholarship came back, this girl told me that, I joined the army, changed my life, okay? So, uh, I ended up going in, it was, uh, I actually had celebrated Christmas twice that year. Because I, I, I got uh, to Vietnam like in, December to celebrate Christmas was also uh, 1967. So I got to celebrate Tet about two weeks later. But, you know, that was just where God put me. Well, I came back, I had a three year commitment, I survived that, came back. Uh, 13 months to go, I'm stationed in Minneapolis, I'm military police. We're living in an apartment, we're we're, our duty station was the airport. It was soft. Okay, and I thought, I'm gonna just slide right out. 13 months, one day, I get orders to go to Korea. You know, three days later, I wouldn't have had to go. And so I, I get the orders to go to Korea. Uh, the guy I'm stationed with said, well, you play college ball. Let me make a call. So I get to Korea. I report in to my station. They go, uh, you're, you're being transferred. I go, where? I went to Seoul. Played football for six months. We'd, 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 we'd have games on the weekend. We had like eight, six or eight teams. All these other guys come marching in. We'd bust in, play a game, go back to Seoul. I learned how to play golf. Played football with guys that were drafting the NFL and that. Learned a whole, a whole different side of sports. Uh, learned what uh, better athletics through pharmaceuticals meant from the guys who played in the Big Ten. But while I was there, I met two guys from Spring Valley, uh, Joe Murtha and uh, Brian O'Mara. And they, Joe said, you should come to school in Eau Claire. No idea where Eau Claire was. I was from Iowa, we didn't even cross the border. And he says, you know, I know the coach there. So I came home in January on leave for my sister's wedding. And my younger brother drove me to Eau Claire. High that day was like 14 below. Okay. I go into McPhee. I meet with Link Walker and Ken Anderson. And I know some of you may know them. 
those guys could sell ice to Eskimos and a freezer. And that's pretty much what that day was, okay? So I come out, and I'm all excited, and my brother's going, God, we gotta get out of here, this is crazy. I, I think I'm gonna go to school here, I said. He goes, you're crazy. <laughs> you are absolutely crazy. But I did, and that brought me to Eau Claire in 1970. I came here to play. God, I was better looking. I even had hair then. And uh, I wrestled too, because I wrestled in high school, so after the football season, the wrestling coach was a D-back coach. He goes, uh, we need a heavyweight. I said, I don't really wanna wrestle anymore. I'm good with football. He says, if you come out for wrestling, you can be heavyweight, you don't have to cut weight, and we travel every weekend to get free buffets. I had no money, so I went out for wrestling. Uh, met great people. I mean, that's the great thing about sports. That's the positive side. You're part of something. You make friends for life. People, and not just friends, people you can count on. A friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. So, guy in life, his name is Tom Bauer. Tom was, uh, played at Grand, he was our quarterback. Uh, he took pity on me, you know, because that's who, I, he just took me in, in 1970. He took me deer hunting, okay? And I think he, he took me because he liked to shoot deer and he needed somebody to drag him for him. And that was me. <laughs> that was me. And, uh, but he, he was just, he's, uh, people who know him, he just got a great sense of humor. He just, he is a, he taught me always to have fun. Okay, guy on my right was my younger brother, Jim, not the one who drove me up here, but he had been in Western Illinois on a track scholarship. He was actually the athlete in the family and got uh, transferred up here. And he was like five years younger than I was, so I really didn't know him that well when we were growing up with nine kids in the family and being that much older. But he came up, he graduated from Eau Claire. Uh, we had a chance to coach in Wausau together. And he, now, as my brother, is probably the closest brother I have, okay? And so, and Tom is still my best friend 50 years later. But if people would know Tom Bauer, everybody in the room would say that he was their best friend because that's how he treats everybody. So, we are the luckiest guys in the world to still be playing a kid's game at our age. We were in our 50s when Tom, we're, we're out road hunting by then because we're not going to crawl in that swamp anymore. Anyway, he goes, and it was. We just had fun. You got, if you don't have fun, don't do it. You know, he won some ball games, we won some ball games, but if you don't have fun, don't do it. I also met this lovely lady. All right, I go to these church things, you know, our FCA things, and he goes, where'd you meet your wife? Oh, met her at Bible camp. Met her at uh, youth group. Uh, met her at uh, some event. Where'd you meet your wife? Shenanigans. <laughs> Hey, it's lasted 48 years. I'll take, it, I'll take care that over Bible camp any day. Anyway, so met her, and then I finished playing Eau Claire. I coached a year, and then I wanted to do my master's. I wanted to coach, but I didn't want to be a classroom teacher. I didn't want, that wasn't for me. So what I do, I went out to be a guidance counselor. Uh, worked with staff down there. It was different, but it really taught me some things. And then uh, married her. Only an offensive lineman would think a guy 245 pounds looks good in all white. <laughs> but that was us. Uh, husband loves your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And that's a process. Because I don't think, you know, I didn't start out that way. Okay? I started out a lot of different ways. We all do. We don't understand how to love our wives. You know? Never criticize your wife's decisions. You're one of them. So don't blame her, okay. But the secret to a successful marriage transformation and uh, the time I talked was just tell me what to think. So this is what I feel is the key to a successful marriage. When we first got married, I just go, this is what I'm going to do. What are you up to? You know, and that doesn't always work so well. So then I kind of went to, this is what I want to do. Okay, that's what I'd like to do. And that still didn't work well. Okay, let's decide what to do. All right? There's only one vote, but we, we think we're still there. And that, right? So, what do you think we should do? <laughs> you know, let's, let's cut to the chase. And then, okay, tell me what to do. <laughs> Just tell me what to do. Make it easy. But still, it wasn't working until we finally came to this. Just tell me what to think. 
let's, let's just get rid of everything else. But what I really learned from this, isn't this our relationship with God? Isn't this how we get to transformation? This is how God transforms us, just to you transform how we should think, how we should live, okay? And you know, that's, that, that's what I found is at the end, Lord, I pray, just tell me what to think. Guide me in that. That will guide me in everything else. Because I sure did a lot of that other transactional stuff when I, you know, with God until I got here. All right, when I left there, I went to Wausau Newman. Uh, this is Buck Grundy. This is old school, uh, uh, once again, Irish Catholic, Joliet, Illinois, head football coach, head wrestling coach, head baseball coach. And he says, you know, on a coach, we had no money. You know, and I'm, I'm, I was actually interning. Mike and Jerry got me this thing where I, I could intern. Well, they didn't have enough money for interns, so I also had to teach freshman religion. And none of them left the church while I was there that I know of. Anyway, we, uh, I, Buck was that guy that just loved on kids. You know, we throw love around a lot. He did. And he could, be, you know, he could, he could cheer, cheer them out, whatever, but he loved on kids. And he taught me that. You just gotta love them. You don't have to like them, Bob. You don't have to like, they're gonna screw up. They're kids. They're gonna screw up. You just gotta love them. You know, all right? And so that's what he taught me. From there I left. Uh, I went up to a small college, Mount Scenario College. Not even there anymore. And this was Bruce Stewart. He was from, he was from Ladysmith, went to lacrosse, came back. And it was through a series of events. He got hired. The head coach left. This guy named Thomas Stell in August. He calls me. I had worked their camp, and he says, hey, you want to come up? I went over for a visit, went home. We were living in Wausau. I said, hey, I just took the job at Mount Scenario. Dead silence. It's like, we got two kids. I'm going to move my wife from Wausau to Ladysmith, Wisconsin. You know, she comes over on a visit. Uh, I find this place we can live, uh, which is right next to railroad tracks. She's not living there, and took her out to eat, and, and, and the restaurant I took, the kids used to call um, Fat Audrey's uh, Choke and Puke. That's where we went to eat, and so my wife just got in the car and says, when you find me a place to live that's a lot better than this, I might think about moving here. But she did. And, but Bruce was that guy. He, he was from Lee Smith, but he could... He loved kids. I mean, we recruited a lot of kids from Florida, a lot of minority kids. And they loved him because he loved them. He was that guy. I learned so much from him. And because I, I wasn't that way, and that's why we worked so well together. So after five years, Bruce left. He, he always wanted to live in Ladysmith, so he took the job at the high school. And uh, I got the head job. Oh, we did have, uh, these are my children. This is my daughter. Uh, she's an Eau Claire grad. She was a music uh, therapy major. She has since gone over to the dark side. She's a high school principal, uh, which leads to a lot of debate in our house. Uh, this is my son. Well, on the left, that's Coach Lichty and his son. On the right, that's Coach Lichty and his dad. The roles have changed. And gravity certainly set in on me. Uh, <clears throat> Josh now, he's, he coaches, coaches down in Onalaska. He's been an elementary teacher for a long time and now teaches at Viterbo uh, in the education department. But those are my two kids. I just threw this up there. This is something we, we did with him. This is, uh, he was our ball boy, okay? Uh, he's valedictorian and he can't spell, but you know, how to be a better ball boy? How to be a ball boy? First, your dad has to be the coach, All right? That's always, that's always number one. If you want to be a ball boy, make sure your dad's coach. Uh, wear old clothes to the games. Okay, you're gonna get ready to get dirty, especially up in Ladysmith. We had that old grass field. It was always money. You may get ran over by football players if you're not paying attention. Okay, never ever go see your friends in the stands. Okay, because they might need the ball. These are words of wisdom from him. And then after the game, pick up the field. But it was a great opportunity to work with him. Okay. Don't let doing God's work get in the way of doing God's will. Okay, so I'm coaching in college. I've, you know, I've just been elevated. It, it, you know, it's an awesome area. For a coach, if you're a head football coach in college, it's a great thing. But it can become your God, too. Okay? And I was doing the right things. I took my kids to church. All right? I gave great talks Saturday before the game. Faith, family, you know. 
you know, faith, family, and, and football. And then I had one of our, one day one of our student assistants came up, he played for me four years, he goes, Coach, you give a great speech about faith, family, and football. He says, you got to inspire us. But he says, i got to be honest. I'm pretty sure God's number one, but I know what's the close second. Okay, and of course he was a young guy and didn't know what he was talking about, but he, he was right. I was. That's who I was. I was a college football coach. You know, I'd done that. So, instead of looking to what God's will was, I just did God's work. I went to church, I did all those, took my shirt, kids did, but I wasn't, you know, doing his will. So, I ended up coaching there, I had coached four years, had a great opportunity to do that. Uh, we won a couple championships. I was coach of the year a couple times. Uh, that was my senior, my last year. My son was the ball boy. Okay, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. My treasure was coaching football. And everything I did, even with my wife, you know, it's like, I gotta do this. I, I gotta go here, I gotta go here, I gotta go here, because that's where my treasure was. Uh, in 1987, for the second time, I was named, we won the conference, I was coach of the year. Bride and I went home at Christmas, you know, and I mean, all my friends from high school, you know, hey, Bob, it's really going well. And then I remember back to when I was a freshman in northern Iowa, 1966. You guys remember Johnny Carson? Okay. He had Lou Holtz on. And Lou Holtz said, there's two kinds of coaches. Those that have been fired and those that will be fired. Uh -huh. And I laughed like everybody else. I come back from Christmas, I walk in, uh, they said stop in the office, I thought okay, I gotta stop in, there must be another award for me, and the vice president, president, we had a new president, he didn't meet me, he said, oh, we're going in a new direction. And I go, what direction is that? Well, it's not a direction with you, you have till noon to clean out your office. And, uh, <clears throat> a side note, my wife had won this cooking thing through American Football Coaches, she had to go on Channel 13 that night and do an interview, <laughs> six hours later and never said a word about me getting fired. But I did, and I struggled. I struggled with my marriage, I struggled with my kids, I struggled with God, because I didn't have a relationship with him. I didn't know how, should I be angry with God? Should I be angry? I'm angry with somebody. And you know, if there was a time in my life I was truly separated from him, that was it. Because God, how could you take away this thing you gave me? You know, this. You have plans for me, for prosperity. I didn't know about this other stuff. So, for I know I have plans for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. I didn't see that right then. I did see this. So, anyway, a friend of mine, Coach in Florida, says, you gotta go to San Francisco, go to American Football Coaches, you'll get a job. And of course, that's what I need to validate. I need to get another job. So I. He says, you can stay with me, we put enough money so I can get out there, I go out to San Francisco, walk, you know, and I am decked out. I have on my blue blazer, light blue shirt, red tie, tan slacks, penny loafers. I walk in the lobby, 3,000 guys look just like me, all looking for jobs. I am deflated. I am, I'm like the head coach of Mount Center College in Lady Smith, Wisconsin, and I got guys from, you know, they've been fired at big schools. So, anyway, I'm walking around. And I see a sign that says, FCA, free food. I am in. I am in there, okay? But when I went in, people were, there were people in there that got fired. And there were people in there that were mad at God. But they had a relationship with him. And they would talk about it. And that was the first time people really honestly talked about it. I didn't get it. But I certainly enjoyed, I shouldn't say I enjoyed, but I, I, I felt I was part of it. There were people who were really honest about how they felt, okay? So, and then, what, here we go to these things, you gotta fill out a card, right? You gotta fill out a card if you go someplace. A couple months later, this guy comes walking in my office, and he goes, hey, I'm Mark Hall, I'm with FCA, you filled out a card. And probably one of the most life-changing days of my life was the day Mark Hall walked in. And that was in 1989, I think, Mark. Somewhere around there. He was a young guy. That he were just, well, we're not on staff very long. I, I was one of the first people. He, he did a lot of things with me. And uh, I think we both got, got better. I know I did because of it. And so Mark just started coming up to visit. He just bring me a book. Stop by. Okay. 
A couple years ago, we came out with this thing with FCA. We call it engage, equip, and empower. Engaging is when we're engaging people, trying to meet them, trying to get to know them, trying to see where they are with their faith life. And then we equip them. Equip them. We try and provide them with tools and that to, to, to get better. And then finally, we empower them to go out and make disciples. And this was this big reveal from FCA. And I'm looking at it going, I thought that's how he always did it, because that's what Mark Hall did to me. That's what he did. He didn't, have a, he didn't have this thing. He lived it with me. So he would try and get me to go to camp after a couple times. And I did a lot of camps, and I always had an excuse. I always had an excuse. So he walks in one year, he's got to go to camp. I look at my calendar, I got a free week. Well, let me tell you, if it takes longer than 15 seconds to come up with an excuse, they know you're lying. And I hit 20 seconds, said, I'll go. Well, we were, go we were over at St. Olaf then, and this is John Stiglmeyer. Uh, first, he just uh, retired a year or two ago from South Dakota State, University of South Dakota. South Dakota State, won a national title, all right? And he was our head clinician. And my story was just like this. I went there to coach football. All of a sudden, I met football coaches that were coaching a different way, that were looking at it a different way. Oh, by the way, when I first met him, he was a teacher at Eau Claire North. And so I started going to camp every year, okay? I love camp, but that's what I was doing. So I was visiting with Mark, I was doing camp, I was getting equipped. And then um, I went to the convention in New Orleans. And I went to the FCA stuff, because it was always good. And we sat there one night, and we had a circle of coaches. We all prayed for each other. I'd, I'd learned to pray for people right now. And uh, there was a young black coach there, and he says, uh, last spring, I got my first job in May, full-time job. He says, I got married in June. September, I found out my wife was pregnant. We all got fired. Would you pray for me? And in that moment, I prayed for him. I didn't think, you know, that's what you do. But as I walked out of there, God you know, spoke to me. Never, I'd never seen it so clearly. As God spoke to me in a, at a time when I prayed for somebody to get what I coveted more than anything, was that job. And when he spoke to me, he said, I let you coach. I'm just telling you where. And I looked back and it was. He was letting me do it, but I didn't appreciate it. Because I, this is what I want. Okay? And he's saying, this is what you need. Brothers, I do not consider myself to take and hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Jesus. I needed to let go of Mount Scenario. I need to let go of all the people I was mad at. I need to let go of that. I was working in Bruce with Brian Kelly, one of my former students. Okay? I had great people I was working with, but I didn't appreciate it. Because I couldn't let go. And when, when I was able to do that, life just opened up to me. Now, I could see where, I probably, I could see where God was moving me. Because I could let go. I was coaching my son. I got a chance to coach him. It was a great experience for me. Maybe not for him, but it was for me. Uh, a couple years later, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was on my way to practice. My son was a senior year. I stopped by the doctor's office. She was had a, just a checkup. I thought I'd say hello. Walk in, the doctor goes, they grab me, walk in the room, and the doctor goes, Bob, Carolyn has cancer. Now we're going to go tell her. If I had not gotten fired and gone through that process with God, I could not have been there for her. I couldn't have. I'd have fell apart. God was preparing me for this day. Okay? That was his, and that's what he prepared me for. It's the confidence that we have in God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he'll hear us. I asked for a lot of things. I asked for a lot of things from God. And at the top of the list was, was, was her. And it was according to his will that she's still with me today. So, then... We brought in this thing to our high school. Uh, one way to play, drug free. We could do that in schools. And at the end of the thing, um, four kids walk in. One was Adam Sturgis, his dad was our minister. There was uh, <coughs> Gary Gerber, Sarah Minoski. So two Lutherans, two Catholics. And they go, we'd like to start an FDA huddle here. And they said, you're the guy to start it. So one of Mark's great 
attributes is he knows when to kick you out of the nest. Because, you know, you'll stay there. Sometimes you need somebody to kick you out. And that was mine to kick out. So I started the Huddle at Bruce. Um, and it was really good. You know, one thing about being involved at the national level, I met a lot of coaches from down south. So when I came up here and people said, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. I don't know, they're, they're doing it. So I didn't know I couldn't, I didn't know what I couldn't do. So I did it. And I was fortunate to have great administrators there. Uh, we moved our camp down to Luther College and I was doing a lot more. Uh, it became a family thing. My granddaughter, um, <clears throat> she went when she was six months. She'll be a freshman in high school. My son started out as a huddle leader. He's now a coach. I have my grandkids. So one week a year I get to spend with my grandkids. That they're not all over the place. And I treasure that. For if you give, forgive people their wrongdoing, your Heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. And that was mine too, is I had to forgive those people who I felt had wronged me. And that wasn't easy. And I still am still working on it. But there was a coach there, the, the Kirk Talley. When I got fired, he got my job. He got my job. And at that time in my life, he took something with me. Nothing to do with him. The coach who gets the next job that wasn't there when you got fired. He just was looking for a new job. Okay? But for years, I carried that around. And I, in the couple years he was at Mount Scenario, I might see him in the distance. I knew who he was. I didn't make his life easy. Uh, I finally met him. We were out at the convention once again in California. We're sitting in the hot tub. I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, he comes walking in the hot tub. All right, this isn't very comfortable, but I guess we better talk. Okay. So we really got to know each other, and he was great. And so finally at camp down at Luther, we're sitting there in the coach's huddle, and there's like 12 of us. And I just felt on my heart that I had to ask for forgiveness for the things I'd done. And of course, he didn't know I'd done anything. But it taught me about forgiveness. And it released me. And we're great friends. He works camps with us. He just came on staff with FCA. He's a great guy. So I'm at camp, and I get a call from Joel Labuda. And he says, uh, I've got an opening in Menominee. I want you to come to Menominee. Okay, and I'd known Joel for a long time. And you know, I'm at FCA camp, and that's kind of a God thing. And if you live in Menominee, a lot of people think he's pretty close to God. So <laughs> I took the job. Called my wife and said, hey, Joe offered a job. Uh, my mother-in-law lives there. She's 99. She can't hear, can't see, as sharp as a tack. All right? Every Sunday I take her communion, me and Jesus. Anyway, so I get to Menominee, and I haven't even started work yet. And then Mark Hall happens to mention to a guy named Jake Boostrom that I'm coming to Menominee. Jake Boostrom has been involved with FCA forever. He calls me up. I didn't start work. All right, we've got to get the huddle going again, and I got this Bible study going. Okay, yesterday I was at that Bible study. We we're at uh, 21 years. In fact, uh, Mike Hewlett is in the back here. He's, he joined us. He's kind of the young guy. But Jake, we still do that Bible study with FCA supporters. You know, I, I went to a funeral once. I was talking to Jake's wife. I said, okay. Jake has three loves in his life. Oh, four. Uh, he loves God. He loves Luther College. Oh, he loves Luther College. He loves FCA. He loves his wife. And I said, I said to her, and I'm not going to tell you what order it is either. Anyway, so I went with Joe, and I went there. Uh, Mark Hall again. Hey, uh, we're going to start these coaches' huddles. Why don't you come to Eau Claire in January for like 10 weeks? Was that it, Mark? We'll just drive in, and it's not bad weather. <laughs> so we had guys from Bloomer, and I came in, and we started coaches' huddles. We, we did a coaches' huddle with Rod Olson stuff. End of the time, we're sitting around, we're getting ready to go, and Mark says, all right, everybody come over here. Bob, here, have a seat in the middle. We're going to send you out to start your first coaches' huddle. <laughs> Kicked out of the nest again. And so I went to Menominee. Mike Hullis, Hullis here. We started a coaches' huddle in Menominee. That was the first time I did it. But once again, God was guiding me. Uh, once again, uh, this was when we played Memorial. We prayed, you know, nobody told me I couldn't pray at the end of the time. They told everybody else, nobody told me, and so we were able to do that. And then eventually our players took it over. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We forget that too often. We're called to be courageous. You're here as men to be courageous. Uh, so now I'm doing coaches' huddles. 
Okay, that's not ours, but it's the only picture I could find. Okay, Mark also introduced me to Joe Ehrman, and this is what I do a lot with coaches. Why do I coach? You know, I told you about the people who influence me. Why do I coach the way I do? And sometimes we have to look at those people who influence, because I, I remember I had a kid up in, in, in um, Mount Scenario that transferred to Eau Claire, and so he was playing for Link, and uh, Link and I always didn't agree, but anyway, I, I talked to the kid one day, and I said, how is he playing for Link? He said, I just closed my eyes, and it sounds just like you. <laughs> yeah, I had to change my ways. Anyway, but uh, they, we do, we're influenced. What's it like to be coached by me? Okay, what do people feel? Am I getting through to them? And then how do I define success? Okay, and Joe Ehrman says, I'll tell you in 25 years. Oops, what did I do? Let me, I'll tell you in 25 years how you did. Um, those two guys with me there, those are Buck Grundy's sons. They both played for me in college. Kevin's on the right, he went in the Hall of Fame as a coach. He was a longtime coach over in Wausau. Uh, these two guys played football and basketball at Mount Scenario. One's Dan Witter and the other's Blaine Sen. They're both in the Hall of Fame for, as basketball coaches. I had the opportunity in the last two years to see all those guys go in the Hall of Fame. And they're great fathers and great husbands. Oh, my grandkids, that's my granddaughter. She's, she's my favorite. And, I don't care if these two know or not. Uh, this is my son, Kenny. He's a freshman here at Eau Claire. He's like every other grandson. He didn't show up today. Um, that's his brother, Isaiah. He's from Ethiopia. Okay. Uh, it's funny. When we got him. He was like five years old. Uh, I don't know, mate. Six months later, Kenny was pretty young, too. And I hear Kenny's introducing his brother to somebody. No, they, they hadn't met him. He says, yeah, this is my brother, uh, Isaiah. He's black and I'm white. <laughs> I guess you, at his age, he could get away with it. But he did. And so uh, Kenny is, is really involved here with AIA and, and with the huddle. He's a huddle leader at camp now. He started out in camp. Isaiah comes to camp. And then Zoe. So, keys to your grandkids. Every time I, I've coached my whole life, here's what I ask my grandkids every game. Did you have fun? First thing I ask them, did you have fun today? Why didn't you? I was worried about this. No, don't tell me what you're worried about. Tell me. Did you get better? Did you get better? Practice, games, whatever. Did you just get better? Okay. Did you help someone else get better? Did you serve somebody else on your team? Did you help somebody else get better? It was about you. And then finally, did you honor and glorify God? Well, how do you do that? Because God created that. Have fun with it. God gave you an opportunity to do something you love. Have fun with it. Get better with that. Help somebody else. Be a serving leader. That's how you honor and glorify God. And then they go, Grandpa, don't you want to know the score? And I, I guess I have to ask. Uh, I didn't know grand dogs were a thing. I never had a dog, did not know a grand dog, you know, and you know, it's like, and then when they go away, you got to take care of their dogs. You know, if I wanted a dog, I'd get a dog. But I got three of them. And of course, my lovely wife there is like, she talks to dogs on FaceTime. Like, when are you going to come visit? We lost those two, but this one is, you know. And of course, just like grandkids, bad habits. You know, they go home, the kids. So, anyway, I retired from Menominee. Uh, had an opportunity to go to Eau Claire, or to Stout, coach their year, get back in college coaching. Had a great time there. Uh, got a call that next summer from Todd Glazer, who was coaching at Eau Claire. Then he goes, Bob. Um, <coughs> I'd like to talk to you about a job. I said, I got a job. I only got to go six blocks to work. Well, just come on over. And then he goes, you know you graduated from here. You at least have to come over. So I went over and I talked to, Mark, to him and he said, Bob, I'm going to be honest with you. He says, we don't win this year. We're getting fired. He says, Bob, we're young and stupid. We're getting fired. But he says, I want to do something different. And Mark Hall says, you're the guy to do it. <laughs> So he brought me over to do characters. He says, I want to do this stuff. But he says, three games in, I'm really worried about winning games. And so I had an opportunity to come over to Eau Claire. We had a great, I had a great time doing it. It's kind of funny, there's my granddaughter, and that was my number in college, so I always love this picture. And at the end of the season, we all got fired. But it was a great year for us, okay? From there, <laughs> I went to lacrosse, which is a different animal, okay? You know, here we're trying to sell ourselves in that. When you walk in with your UWL, people want to meet you. 
And I, I spent two years with Mike Schmidt there, who we'd had at Menominee High School. It was a great experience. And then finally, my wife said it's time to come home. I was living with my son uh, during the season and that. And so I came home, and then Mark Hall goes, well, you should come on staff and told Andrew, he used to come on staff with FCA. You're not doing anything. You're retired. Okay, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Thank God for the broken road. So, when I'm on staff with FCA, I do coaches ministry, which is to and through the coach, to pursue our vision and mission through strategy of to and through the coach. We seek to minister first to the coach, their hearts, their marriages, their families. Then when ready, we minister through coaches to their fellow coaches, teams, and athlete leaders. I had a chance this weekend to talk to a couple of our coaches from Stout. This is, you know, people said, well, you know, do you share the gospel? Well, I'm Catholic. I thought the gospel came after the second reading. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> but we use this with an Athletes in Action, this kind of sports thing. And I had a chance to use it with two young Stout coaches this weekend. The gospel is simply, do you love God? You know, people can agree on that. We're separated from God by sin. We're saved by Christ dying on the cross. And then finally, do you trust Christ? Do you trust him? And in my work, you know, when I, when going back to where I first got in SCA, how do you work with kids that are Catholics and Lutherans and everything else? Well, first of all, I focus on the first three. Let's get through those. Now, how do you trust Jesus? That, well, that's where you go to church. We're not a church. Go to that church. You know, we have some different ways we, we worship in that. But we all, if we're biblical based and we follow those first ones, we'll be all right. And it's, I have it on a bracelet. Now our guys all have them. And if you, it's funny, sometimes you look at, on, on TV at sports things, you'll see coaches in, in the boxes that'll have the four. So, the other thing in trusting Jesus is what? Love God, love others, and make disciples. And this is my thing. It's not badminton like Andrew Draper would tell you. It's be a disciple maker. So everything I, all my stuff has BADM. And I have a bracelet with that to give her. I don't want to just have our players become disciples. I want them to become disciple makers. I want them to take that out with them. Um, <clears throat> and when I came on staff... And he's told you, I, I'm all excited, and I go in for a checkup, and they tell me, oh, you got to go to Rochester. you got Barrett syndrome. I had no idea what that was. And I go down there, and, oh, you got esophageal cancer. We're going to take out your esophagus next week. Uh, and that was in August. So I go down, they take my esophagus out. There was a complication. I was there about a month. don't have cancer. So I take a year to recuperate. I'm going, next year, I'm, I'm really ready to go in the fall this year. That's football season. Uh, the VA has me get checked up. Oh, you have lung cancer now. And uh, so I get five radiation treatments. But Marshfield, cancer's gone. Boom. I'm hoping I don't hit the hat trick, though. Uh, <clears throat> so then I go, we, we used to love to go to Hawaii. So we go to Hawaii. I'm going to come back. I'm really ready to go. Uh, it's March of 2020. <laughs> and March 20th, we're due to come back. And we're watching on TV. They're like shutting down the state basketball tournament. They're doing all this, and we're on the beach in Hawaii. We don't have any idea till we flip Minneapolis. So I became a Zoom master. And what I do today, I have uh, like five coaches huddles I Zoom with. Guys that know each other. I have one that I do with a coach from Orlando, Beloit, Michigan, and South Dakota. But they were all friends. So we meet once a week. I have a couple in person. Uh, I have a really unique one. I have two coaches from Stout, two coaches from Whitewater in the same huddle on Friday mornings. They're all young guys. They're all friends. And so I had to embrace what God gave me, and that was Zoom. And that's kind of what I do. A man's heart plans his course, but the Lord determines his step. Okay? And that's why I'm here today. I also work with the basketball team at Stout. No clue. No clue what to do. All right? Uh, I am the Ted Lasso. Probably this is the wrong time to talk about Ted Lasso. But anyway, <laughs> of basketball. But I really found out, the coach one day we were talking, is that as a coach, he wants, you know, he's concerned about those guys outside of basketball. But he's a college basketball coach. He has to win some games. I am the guy that's there that is concerned, more concerned about what they are outside basketball. And the fact that I don't know anything about it makes it a lot easier. 
is that I can just be concerned about spiritual life, how they're doing, and things like that. So, just finally, uh, God moved me at a point in my life to do a couple mission trips. So, I did my first mission trip at 73. I went to Peru. And I probably should have paid more attention to uh, geography class in high school because I flew out of here in June only to fly into Peru when it's winter there. and was not prepared. But uh, the Diocese of La Crosse has an orphanage there on the left, and uh, I, I did that. So then last summer, uh, I went FCA, we were international, and I went with a group of uh, college interns to South Africa. And I spent two weeks there, once again, study geography, South Africa is in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, rainy season. So I fly out of beautiful Wisconsin to that. So, that's my story. That's who I am. <laughs>